This is Dr. Weislogel, and this is an introduction to the course Philosophy and Liberation. So I want to situate uh, our study, Philosophy and Liberation, in terms of a philosophical curriculum uh, that we've practiced here at this university, at least we have in the past, uh, and uh, just want to talk you through this uh, matrix here to kind of see where what we're going to look at this semester uh, really kind of fits in. So it used to be, not, 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 not for you guys now, but it used to be that the first course that everybody had to take at uh, our, our university was a course called The Human Person. And it, it asked the basic questions, who am I? Who are we? What does it mean to be human? What's our place in the cosmos? Uh, it seems like the primary philosophical question. Who, who am I? We, we are the beings who are uh, reflective. We are the beings who can ask about our own being, uh, unlike everything else, as far as we know. So th the primary philosophical question is uh, this, this, this question taken up by uh, uh, this course that we used to have called the human person. Now we, we've re replaced that and we've made your uh, first course, the moral foundations course, which you, you've, you've all taken, I, I'm sure. Uh, and that's the, the ethics class. And that raises different questions. Uh, how is it best for me to be? How is it best for us to be? Before questions of um, um, right and wrong, before questions of duties, before calculations of the greatest good for the greatest number, before considerations of commandment or, or, or political uh, uh, practices and laws, before all those questions, for, those to, to, for us to even be able to evaluate those questions requires us to, to ask a general question. How is it best for me to be? How is it best for us to be? But you can't answer how is it best for a thing to be if you don't know what kind of thing we're talking about. So if I held up an object you've never seen before, I'd say, is this a good one? You would say, well, I don't know what that is. Tell me what it is. And then maybe I could try to figure out if it's a good one of those or not. So uh, that's why, even in the Moral Foundation course, if, you, if you've taken it with me, we, we, we always raise that, that human person question first. Who are we? What kind of a thing are we? How do we conceive of ourselves? How do we take ourselves to be? And then from there, try to figure out how is it best for us to be. Now, th these, these two courses in some ways can map on to some traditional philosophical questions. Uh, the first question we might ask is, you know, how do I know? <laughs> uh, that was Kant's first question. Uh, Kant thought that all human beings were constituted in a way by three fundamental questions. The first of which is, what can I know? We, we would call that the epistemological question. And as a philosophical subject, epistemology, as you know, is concerned with the truth. What makes true claims true? What constitutes genuine knowledge and how is it separated from uh, mere opinion? So it's a question of truth. The truth about ourselves is what we ask in the human person course. Who, what, what is the truth about us? Not, not just how do we seem, but how, how, are, how are we really? What is the truth really? Uh, and then in the Moral Foundations course, we, we get into that question, what ought I to do? If I, if I can figure out how it's best for me or us to be, then what ought I or we to do in order to bring about the best for us? And that's the philosophical question that deals with the nature of the good. What is the good in the way of our actions? What is the good in the way of our decisions? What's the good in the way of our behaviors? And the philosophical uh, subdiscipline, if you want to call it that, is uh, moral philosophy or ethics, your, the, the subject matter of your moral foundations course. Now, what about the, the, the philosophy and liberation course? Well, um, maybe I'm trying to force this into this matrix. I'll, I'll let you decide that. But if you follow out the logic of our questioning, who am I, who are we? And then once we have some kind of sense how to answer that kind of question, then we can ask, well, how is it best for us to be? What, what would be best? Is there better and worse? And if there's better, how do we, how do, how do, how do we what, what would that look like? And then in the philosophy and liberation course, we, we want to ask about that. What, what, like, where are we headed? Uh, what, what is to become of us? If we're not as best as we can be, how, how might we get there? Can we get there? 
What are our chances for get there, for getting there? What is our, as Aristotle would call it, what is our telos? What is our final cause, our end or aim or goal or purpose? And Kant thought that was, uh, in effect, the third question that all that constitutes what it means to be a, a human. For what may I hope? Um, you know, Kant says we, we, we are what it means to be human can be thought of in terms of these three questions. And then you might say, well, you know, I've never really asked that question. What can I know? You, you probably from time to time in life at least have asked what ought I to do. And, you know, maybe you've asked about what you might hope for or uh, so forth. But you might say, I don't really ask all those questions. Uh, so how is it that human beings are constituted by these questions? And, and Kant's answer would be, it's, he's not saying that you ask these questions specifically. In fact, philosophers tend to be the, the, the among others, tend to be the, the people who ask those questions explicitly. But all of us are living out our lives and as we do, we are tacitly or implicitly giving our answers to those questions. In you know, looking at social media and looking at the news, when we're trying to figure out what's going on, we're, we're asking that question, what can I know? When we're trying to figure out, you know, what, what, what kind of job do I take or what courses should I, should I sign up for or how should I vote? You're asking, what ought I to do? Uh, and, and in a way, you wouldn't be doing any of those things if if there were not a future to be possible, uh, and the, and hope aims towards a, a, towards a future. So philosophy and liberation course is going to try to address that third question in a way: for what may I hope, and 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 where are we headed, and and how might we get there, given that we have some understanding of who we are and how it's best for us to be. Now, the the, the three classic questions of 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 philosophy, the primary questions besides the, the fundamental why and what is it really question that, that make up philosophy in the first place is, you know, when philosophers ask why and what is it really about the nature of knowledge and truth, they're doing epistemology. When philosophers ask why and what is it really about the nature of the good, they're doing ethics or moral philosophy. And when philosophers ask why and what is it really about the beautiful, they, they are doing something called aesthetics. And uh, you might think, well, I don't, I don't understand for this, this idea of, uh, of maybe how philosophy and liberation is about the beautiful. I can kind of figure out, you know, the question about the human person is what, what's the truth about us. I understand the question of moral foundations, what's the nature of the good, but why is, why is philosophy and liberation about the beautiful? Well, to, to make this fit, and again, I admit, you know, possibly I've tried to shoehorn this in a little bit, but... You have to think of the ancient Greek understanding of the beautiful, the beautiful. Uh, and, um, you know, we said that the, the field of study uh, in philosophy uh, that pertains to the beautiful or focuses on the beautiful and art and uh, the sublime and so forth, we call that aesthetics. But, you know, this, the study of beauty uh, it could could easily be cosmetology, cosmetology, and you know that's what you study when you when you go to beauty school. That's what you study when you you want to go on to to, to be a beautician. Uh, and you know, but but the Greek word for that uh, cosmetology co cos comes from the Greek cosmos, and that same word cosmos can be found in cosmos, the English word cosmos, or cosmology, which is the study of the cosmos, the study of the universe, the whole shebang, everything. So how does beauty school, cosmetology, and cosmology, the study of everything, the study of the universe, how do they go together? And I think maybe the best way to, to, to see what the Greeks had in mind here is to think of the antonym of that Greek word cosmos, the antonym is the Greek word chaos, where we get our word chaos from. The opposite of cosmos is chaos or chaos. So what is the what is chaos? Well, it's disorder. So if chaos, chaos, disorder is the antonym or the opposite of the beautiful, what's cosmos? It must be order. So cosmos is order, chaos is disorder. So for the Greeks, the idea of beautiful was related essentially to order. When things were in order, things were the way they were truly meant to be, and things were good. 
the good, the true, and the beautiful for the ancients were what we call convertible. When you're talking about one, you're talking about them all, the good, the true, and the beautiful. So I think in a way, the philosophy and liberation course aims at a kind of a hope to find the proper order of things, not necessarily in the sense of law and order, not necessarily in the sense only of constriction or restriction, but also in the sense of freedom, freeing things up, liberating them to be where they ought to be and be headed where they ought to be headed and to be hopeful for what they might attain so that things might be best for me, best for us. So th that's my understanding of where this philosophy and liberation course kind of fits into a general uh, uh, human-focused philosophical uh, curriculum or, or course of study or course of questioning. Uh, some of the basic questions that we're going to get to in this course is what do we mean by philosophy? And you might be throwing up your hands at this point and saying, you know, I've, I've uh, taken at least one philosophy course before, maybe several philosophy courses before. What, why do we need to stop and ask ourselves yet again, what is philosophy? I've taken a lot of philosophy courses. I, I think I know. Well, one of the things that makes philosophy interesting compared to pretty much any other kind of study that you take up is philosophy is constantly asking itself, what is it? What is, what is it really? Uh, how do we really pursue wisdom? How do we, how do we, how do we fulfill our love of wisdom, our philosophia? How do we do that? And philosophers are, are self-reflective just because philosophy is so human, so essentially human. We're the self-reflective beings, so philosophy itself is self-reflective. We're always asking, what exactly do we mean by philosophy? Uh, and that doesn't imply, and it shouldn't imply to you, that we have no idea what philosophy is. We, we certainly do. You certainly do. But we're always revisiting that question to make sure that we are really getting at the truth of our philosophical questions. We're always revisiting the question, what is philosophy? Because we want to make sure that we are doing philosophy the best it can be done. And we're constantly re revisiting that question of what is philosophy? Because we, we have hope. We have hope for a better understanding of ourselves hope for a better chance to be the best we can be. And if there are obstacles or barriers to our being the best we could be, maybe we could liberate ourselves from them if we do philosophy in a, in a certain kind of way. Uh, we also want to ask the, the question, what is the relationship between philosophy and religion? And that's going to be very important uh, in, in this course because of the, the thinkers that we're going to, uh, whose work we're going to explore. Uh, but in, in many ways, as you might imagine, philosophy and religion tend to ask similar kinds of questions. Who are we? What's our place in the cosmos? How are we meant to be? How is it best for us to be? There is a relationship between them. I think you certainly would have the sense that they're not identical. They're not doing things exactly the same way. The question is going to be, uh, how are they related and are they separable? Because if we want to get at the truth... Uh, we, we can't necessarily rule certain uh, avenues out in advance. Uh, so we'll have to look at that relationship. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to have to look at the relationship between philosophy and politics. Uh, why? Because, as Aristotle said, and all our philosophers will agree, uh, at least in this course, we'll agree that we are social political beings by nature. It's in our essence. To be who we are means to be in a polis. That's the Greek word for city or community. We are communal social beings. We're beings of language. There's no such thing as a private language. Language by its very nature is communal and social. So if we're talking about who we are, and then trying to understand how it's best for us to be, and then working towards getting there, we have to do things. So we have to look at the relationship between theory, and that, that comes from a Greek word, theoria, uh, which means to, to see things clearly, to see clearly. So our scientific theories are just our attempts to see clearly why things are the way they are. The scientific theory of evolution is to help us see why there's so darn many species. The scientific theory of gravity has helped to, helps us try to see why when I drop something, it goes to the floor and not to the ceiling. Right? It's a kind of seeing. 
And we want to see how that's related to praxis. That's a Greek word uh, th that where we get our word practice from. Uh, and it's our, our doing, but not just any old doing, but a mindful doing, a theoretically informed praxis, uh, a, a theoretically informed activity. Uh, so we want to look at the, how that works, how they work together. How does what we do in this class, for instance, philosophical reflection, how does that translate out into the world of doing things, the social and political world of action? And then we certainly have to ask, what do we mean by liberation? Uh, many, you've, you've certainly all heard the word, and you may have some uh, uh, definition in mind when you hear it, but it's something that we want to ask. What do we really mean by that? And, and to try to figure that out, to try to get a handle on liberation, we have to ask a series of questions about it. So, liber, free, freedom, you know, liberation from what? Like, what do we need liberation from? If we are indeed in need of liberation, or if some people are in need of liberation, from what? What, what are the conditions or barriers or obstacles from which we hope to liberate ourselves or liberate others? And then we need to ask the question, liberation by means of what? H how are we going to bring it about that we or others are liberated? What, what, what's the means of pursuing that. And then we should ask liberation to or in order to. I mean, wh 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 where, are we, where are we going? Like, what's the, what's the direction of this? We're going from a, a situation which demands or seems to require liberation to where? Uh, and then the last question is, you know, liberation for the sake of what? what wh wh why? Do we want to get to where we want to get? Why do we want to get there? For for what? What what's the what's the overarching reason or rationale for that? What's the end or aim or goal or telos of liberation? So these preparations, the the from, the by, the to, the for, they they, they really matter. There's tiny little words, but so much uh, matters in those words. They're they're, they're to try to come to some kind of, of way to fill in these four blanks here is going to pre-position any philosophical work that ensues from that. It's going to get us set up right to be able to do philosophy for, with the aim of truth, goodness, beauty, and liberation of anything that stands in the way of that, any barriers or obstacles to that. So we want to try to get pre-positioned to asking our philosophical questions of philosophy and liberation. And then, you know, here's another question. What do we mean by liberating philosophy? It's a, there's a double meaning here. Uh, philosophy, in a way, as a tool or a means of liberating, you know, a philosophy that liberates. Liberating here would be like the adjective, a certain kind of philosophy, a certain description of philosophy. What kind of philosophy do you do? Well, I do the kind that liberates. All right, that's what's distinctive about the way I do philosophy. That's important. You know, there are, and I think we'll, we'll see this sooner rather than later, there are philosophical approaches that are the antithesis of liberating. There are certain philosophical views and certain philosophical pursuits that themselves throw up barriers or obstacles to us knowing the truth about ourselves and being the best we can be and possibly attaining our hopes. So we want to be able to distinguish the kind of philosophy we would like to practice in this course. But there's also the meaning liberating philosophy as a task or a or job that needs to be done uh, liberating as a duty. We've come here to liberate philosophy. Philosophy itself is in need of liberation. Philosophy itself has been uh, bound by certain obstacles or barriers from attaining its greatest hopes, its greatest aims and goals. So we may need, we may find that we need to do that as well. We may need to see how philosophy has been restrained or contained or restricted or constricted. We, we, we may have to see how that happened, what caused that to happen, and then try to figure out how to set philosophy itself free. Uh, and if it were 
free <laughs> uh, if it were uh, undisciplined in a way. You know, we think of philosophy as another one of the disciplines. There's, there's, there's economics and there's history and there's literature and there's, there's French studies and so forth. Those are the academic disciplines. And, and what we mean by that is, you know, people become uh, disciples, they become students, uh, and they, they take on a certain yoke in order to learn uh, a certain uh, a field of study and, and develop some expertise in those fields. And we tend to think of philosophy as another one of those disciplines because it looks the same. Um, it has a department at the university. Uh, it's got faculty, and that's their specialty, the, f their, the philosophy professors. And there are textbooks, and there are exams and grades and, and all the rest that you would find in any other kind of discipline. Uh, it may be the case, though, that unlike those other disciplines, philosophy itself is masquerading as a discipline, that it's uh, been housed at the university for certain purposes. Uh, one of those purposes may be to contain or constrain how philosophy gets done, even though that seems to be the main place where philosophy gets done in the world. There's not a little philosophy shop down the street next to the Starbucks. So uh, what about it? F philosophy has been disciplined. Well, if, if that might be, um, if that might be a, a, an example of how philosophy might need to be liberated, then what would undisciplined philosophy look like? What would that look like? What would it mean to exile philosophy from the only home it seems to have these days in the world, which is within the confines of, of, the, of, of the university? What, what might that be? So one of the things I want to do in this course is to look at the relationship between philosophy and the idea of exile exile. And you'll, you'll see what I mean as we go along. It uh, pertains to the kind of thinkers and their life stories uh, uh, that we're going to examine this semester. So philosophy and exile. Uh, and as I alluded to, so what is the role of the university in liberating philosophy? Remember, two senses of liberating philosophy. Can you get the kind of philosophy that liberates in a university? Or is it because the philosophy is contained or constrained within the university? Is it itself in need of some kind of liberating? What is the role of philosophy also in liberating the university? Like what we're doing here. Are we free, free as university people, students and, and, and teachers, are we liberated to attain our greatest hopes in doing things the way we do them? So I'm, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask us to ask ourselves, are we in need of liberation? Uh, and if not, you know, the question is, does it or should it matter to us that others might be in need of liberation? I mean, maybe they ask the question, do I, do I need liberation? No, I do not. Well, what about other people? Might other people need liberation? And if your answer happens to be yes to that question, then my question to us would be, well, what is our responsibility there? Are we able to respond? And if we are, should we respond? Now, there's different levels at which this particular course operates. Uh, somebody else uh, teaching a course called Philosophy and Liberation might do things very, very differently. There's uh, many, many different directions uh, that we can go. But I, I, I think the way I've kind of pulled this together operates in certain kind of ways. Uh, one way would be, you could think of it as three interesting Spanish slash Latin American thinkers and their interrelationships. Because the, the main uh, philosophers that we are going to talk about in this course uh, are, are Spanish language speakers. Uh, the first uh, that we'll get to, uh, well, the first one we'll get to in some depth. We'll talk about a few others beforehand. But the first we'll get to in depth is a philosopher named Javier Zubiri. Javier Zubiri. Um, Spaniard, he's Basque, he, his, his specialty in, in philosophy was metaphysics. And you might remember the definition of metaphysics is uh, the study of being qua being, the study of being as such, the study of existence or reality, the basic nature of reality. That's what, that was his main focus at the height of his career. Uh, he was very, he had some very interesting theories about how humans come to know 
Uh, his ideas, call, he refers to it as sentient intelligence, and we'll talk about what the, that big phrase means. He was also a very gifted and insightful philosopher of religion and where religion comes from and what its role is in human life. He was Jesuit ed- educated. He became a priest, but he he, he left the priesthood for reasons that, that we'll talk about. Uh, and he also left the university. I mean, he had a very fine uh, university position, very important position, but he left the university. He taught most of his career outside the university. He taught most of his career in his, in his apartment, uh, as a matter of fact. Very interesting story, and I think you'll, you'll find it interesting, and we'll talk about him. So Javier Zubiri. Uh, and then the, the second person we're going to focus on is uh, Ignacio Elacuria. Uh, Eacria, uh as, as a Jesuit, uh, also Spanish from Basque country, but he lived and worked mainly in El Salvador uh, at the UCA, uh, the, the University of Central America in, in San Salvador, Simeon Cañas. Uh, he was a leading light of liberation theology, so we'll need to talk about that when we talk about the relationship between religion and theology and philosophy. Uh, but he was also a very uh, gifted uh, philosopher, and he studied and eventually became a collaborator with Zubiri. Uh, and at, at a certain point, Zubiri wouldn't even think about uh, putting out his work without running it past uh, Ea Korea. Uh, he, he was a university man, a university leader. He helped organize uh, the UCA in El Salvador, and uh, he thought extensively about the nature of the university and what it's for. And as you may know from some of the, the plaques and signs around our campus, he, he was assassinated by, you know, U.S.-backed government forces, uh, and his, along with several of his colleagues and his housekeeper and his housekeeper's daughter. Uh, it's a, a, a terrible story and one that we will get to know in the course of, of this uh, class, because I, I do want to ask about uh, setting or context when doing philosophy. And then finally, we'll, we'll end up the, the course talking about Enrique Dusso. Uh, st- he's still going and still going strong. He's an ethicist, uh, wrote a shelf load of books on ethics and politics and philosophy of history. Uh, he's an Argentinian, but he's been living in exile in Mexico uh, since uh, 1975 when uh, the, a paramilitary group bombed his house. Uh, and his, and we'll, we'll talk about that. And, and he is really known as the founder of philosophy of liberation movement, philosophy of liberation movement as, as, as such. So these are three important thinkers, three important Spanish language thinkers um, that we will focus on this semester. None of these names really are household names. They're not even philosophy department household names. And I want to say something, uh, you know, quickly uh, about the reason for that. The reason for that is they speak, they spoke Spanish. They wrote in Spanish. And you know, teachers know who, what they know because of who taught, who, who taught them because of who their teachers were and their teachers know what they know because what their teachers taught them and nobody can study everything and over time there have developed certain philosophical trends or fashions or or, or pathways that have been well trodden so for instance in my case when i went to graduate school in philosophy there are requirements that uh, we learn both some ancient and some modern non-English languages. And the four, the big four were in the ancient world, Greek and Latin, and in the contemporary world, uh, French and German, because the most important philosophers spoke either Greek or Latin or French or German. Not Italian, not Arabic, not Russian, and not Spanish, even though there are way more Spanish speakers in the world than German speakers or French speakers. Why? Prejudice? Maybe. But also just you teach kind of what you know. And I I maybe uh, am somewhat of an outlier here because I discovered all of these thinkers on my own out of curiosity and even some serendipity, which I'll, I'll talk to you about later, uh, how I came to, to, to think, think along with these important thinkers. Uh, but just because they're not in the 
you know, top 40 pop philosophy list doesn't mean there are not profound, serious, important, insightful, and even brilliant thinkers in their own right. And they're certainly worth our attention. So we will, we will attend to them. Uh, we can also look at this course as philosophy of liberation as a, as a movement or as a, as a thing. Uh, it, it would be tracing a particular intellectual historical line of Spanish Latin American thought running from Zubiri through Ayacria through Dussel. That, that, that is a legitimate um, approach to a course like that. Uh, philosophy of liberation is a thing. As I said, it's been mostly labeled or associated with Enrique Dussel, but uh, you can't understand Dussel without understanding liberation theology, and you can't understand uh, Ayacria's version of liberation theology without knowing about Zubiri. Uh, so there's that. Uh, Ayacria and Dussel have expressly thematized liberation, uh, but again, it's Zubiri's thought that underlies this, that undergirds all this, even though Zubiri really never wrote a lot about ethics and, and very, very little about politics. Uh, that's interesting to me. What is the translation b between the very, as many people would say, kind of ethereal study of the nature of reality to a kind of political thought informed by that philosophy that's so powerful it creates enemies, enemies that will exile its proponents, even try to kill them, and even successfully kill them. Right? How, how, how does that work? How, how, does this, how does a reflection on the nature of reality make you a danger, at least perceived danger, to your community where people will try to kill you and maybe even succeed in killing you. Uh, this movement that we, we are going to look at in this light, uh, you know, exhibits a kind of doing a philosophy in situation, in context, in particular in context of oppression. And all three of these thinkers themselves can be seen as philosophizing in exile. Zubiri outside the university, Aya Korea from the church, at least in, the, in his context, and Dussel from his own homeland. Uh, it's a kind of philosophy enacted under threat, including the threat of death. Now, if you think about what you know about the history of philosophy so far, you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, that's actually not new, is it? What happened to Socrates? <laughs> you know, how did he end up? He was asking a lot of big questions, and the next thing you know, he was tried, convicted, and made to drink the hemlock uh, that caused his death. He was executed. So, it's nothing new about philosophy. Why is that? Why is just asking these kind of questions so threatening to so many people? Uh, it, and it shows that the movement, at least this kind of movement of philosophy, has some real world effects, some real political consequences uh, for pursuing it. We want to keep that in mind. Uh, a third way of thinking about this is philosophy and liberation as a philosophical line of questioning, as I've already kind of laid out to you, questioning concerning the relationship between philosophy, what it is, what it does, and liberation, wh what it would mean and how we would achieve it and what philosophy's role would be in that. And then we could look at uh, this idea of liberating philosophy with the double entendre there, the double meaning, as a reflection on who we are here now. Who are we? <laughs> right? In the end, really knowing about some uh, aging or, or, or deceased philosophers recently or maybe thousands of years ago, you know, maybe that's interesting, but let's face it. What do we really care about? We care about ourselves. We care about our world. We care about the people who mean something to us. We care about the people who we th see to be threatening to the people who mean something to us. Who are we? How is it best for us to be? And, and for what may we hope? That might be it too. We are philosophers, students and teachers, uh, right here in a university, which is an embodiment of philosophy. Uh, you know, you think about it. All those people who are your professors in all their different fields, why do you call them Dr. So-and-so? Because they have a PhD. And what does that stand for? Doctor of Philosophy. So somebody like me with a PhD in philosophy is redundant. Doctor of Philosophy and Philosophy. Right? It's, it's the university itself is an embodiment of philosophical reflection. It is an embodiment. It represents some of the answers to those questions of Kant. Who are we? What can we know? 
for what, what should we do and for what may we hope? All right? We need to look at ourselves. What is our purpose here? Are we in need of, of liberation? And if, and, if, and if not us, does anyone? And if anyone does, what's our responsibility as philosophers, as university people?